Hi everyone, I hope you all have been well since my last upload. Today I'm covering a case that was so shocking and heartbreaking to read up on. It's such a senseless act, with so many lives destroyed all because of one person's unfortunate decisions. Let's get right into the case. David Bennett Katz was born on December 22, 1993, to married couple Richard and Elizabeth Katz. Richard was a NASA engineer who worked at the Goddard Space Flight Center, and Elizabeth was working as a toxicologist for the Food and Drug Administration. The two had another son named Brandon, who was three years old when David was born. The four of them lived in Maryland, which is where David would grow up. During his childhood, David reportedly struggled with his mental health. I wasn't really able to find anything else about his life when he was young, which is strange. He is definitely one of the shooters with little known or reported about their background. Anyway, what I did find is that David's parents got divorced sometime in 2005 or 2006, when he was only 12 years old. David's father, Richard, was accusing his mother, Elizabeth, of adultery and verbal abuse, citing these as his reason for divorce. According to their divorce records, David had previously been treated for emotional and psychological issues. When he was a child, he was placed on a few medications. According to court documents, he was prescribed an antipsychotic medication called Risperidone, sometimes used to treat schizophrenia. He was also put on Lexapro, which is an antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication. According to his father, David exhibited no signs of schizophrenia whatsoever. He remarked, quote, David seems well aware of reality at all times. A letter from Richard's attorney stated that David was seen by, quote, a succession of psychiatrists. This statement was true. His mother did take him to see a number of psychiatrists during, and also a social worker at one point during his childhood. Richard also wrote, quote, she had an obsession with using mental health professionals, and in particular psychiatric drugs to perform the work that parents should naturally do. Richard testified during the divorce that another psychiatrist had recommended that David actually be taken off of the medications. Richard also brought up an FDA study which went into detail about the increased suicidal thoughts and actions of people 18 and younger who take certain antidepressants. Another filing from the divorce claimed that a therapist stated that David had possibly experienced a psychiatric crisis due to his worsening depression. David's parents could not come to an agreement about how to best treat him. According to the records, his mom wanted to continue to have psychiatric evaluations done on David and also wanted to continue his medications. His dad, on the other hand, simply wanted him to join and attend a support group for children around his age. Obviously, these two options varied significantly from each other, and a middle ground was not reached. As I'm sure you can tell, David's parents' divorce did not go well in the slightest. The tension was extremely high, and both sides were hostile towards each other, so much so that a custody agreement could not be made and both sides filed to have a court-appointed guardian assigned to represent David's best interests. It was recommended that Elizabeth should be granted full custody of David following the divorce, which is what ended up happening. David and his mother regularly got into arguments at home. Many of these stemmed from his bad habits surrounding video games. David was obsessed with them, often preferring them over attending school. I also read that his mother complained that he would go without bathing in order to continue his gaming. His mother later said, quote, his hair would go unwashed for days. She also said, quote, when I took his gaming equipment and controllers away so he couldn't play at three or four in the morning, I'd get up and find that he was just walking around the house in circles. The arguments between David and his mother continued for years, with the police even having to become involved multiple times. His mother later claimed that when David was agitated, he would throw himself into crying fits, lay on the floor in a fetal position, or lock himself in his room or her car. He was also known to bash his head against the wall during these fits. On one occasion, Elizabeth took David's controllers away and locked them in her bedroom. 
His response was to punch a hole through the wall to retrieve them. The two of them rarely saw eye to eye, and the police calls continued throughout the years. According to David, police were called to the home around 20 times in total. Some were from his mother, seeking help to discipline David, and others were from David himself, complaining that his mother kept punishing him by taking his video games away. According to a New York Post article on this case, David's mother attempted to kick him out of the home at least twice when he was a young teenager. Two separate times in 2007, one in August, and another in December, David reportedly spent two weeks in psychiatric care facilities. The next month, in January of 2008, David was involuntarily admitted to a therapeutic wilderness school for teens, located in Utah. I could not find any more information about these three events, but still wanted to add them in. In a letter, dated December 22, 2009, David begged the court to allow him to live with his father. The letter read, quote, Dear Judge, today is my birthday, and I'm turning 16 years old. I live with my mom, and have been wanting to live with my dad. My mom is pretty crazy. She's called the police on me about 20 times for pretty much nothing, like coming home a little late or something. She also gets drunk and starts yelling at me and poking me and doesn't leave me alone. She has hit me before and always takes my stuff because she feels like it. I hate her more than anything in the world. Sincerely, David Katz. The courts decided not to overturn their previous decision, and four months later, David again wrote a letter to them, telling them he wanted to go live with his dad. This never ended up happening, and David was forced to stay at his mother's house full time. David attended Hammond High School in Columbia, Maryland. According to his classmates in later interviews, David was very reserved and didn't socialize with others regularly. One of his classmates, Drew Ford, said, quote, He was a quiet kid, but when you talk to him, he seemed cool. Another classmate, Tiandre Montana, stated, quote, He stayed to himself. He didn't talk much. He was a good guy. I couldn't imagine him doing such thing. Three years after graduating high school in 2011, David enrolled at the University of Maryland. He majored in environmental science and technology. David attended his first round of classes, but was not able to keep up with his grades and was never registered for his fall classes. Ultimately, David never earned a degree. Natalie Gill, a teacher's assistant from the University of Maryland later recalled, quote, I knew the other students very well, but he did not open up the same way as the others did. I pulled him aside and asked if there was anything I could do to help, and he basically had no reaction to that. During this time in his life, David finally moved to his dad's house in Baltimore, Maryland. David began to make a name for himself in the Madden community. If you didn't know, Madden is a video game centered around football. Anyway, David's odd personality and gameplay style definitely set him apart from the other players, and fellow competitors picked up on it quickly. In February of 2017, David competed in a Madden tournament. He was responsible for what was described by EA Sports at the time as the most exciting moment in all 2017 NFL Club Series championships. David, the seventh seed, was tied to win against the top-seeded player, Carlos Los Yancey. David was able to win the match, solidifying his victory in the competition. David won $3,500 and a trip to Las Vegas to compete in the next tournament. During the next competition, on air a commentator said about David, quote, David Katz keeps to himself, he's not here to make friends, and to even get him to open up to talk to you about anything. It's like pulling teeth, man. David was obviously standoffish around people, and everyone knew it. He truly did not care to socialize with anyone, which is ironic, seeing as he was part of one of the most social communities in esports. Anyway, Sometime in late July or August 2018, the now 24-year-old David Katz legally purchased a 9mm handgun, as well as a 45 caliber handgun, which was equipped with a laser sight. Since 2013, Maryland requires all people who wish to purchase a handgun to complete and obtain a handgun qualification license. This means that David was required to submit his fingerprints, undergo a background check, and pass a firearm safety training course before being able to buy his guns. Even though he had previously spent weeks in mental health care facilities, it was not enough to prohibit him from purchasing a firearm. Now, after explaining a little bit about David's background, 
Let's look at the events of August 25th and 26th, 2018. It was a warm and partly cloudy weekend in Jacksonville, Florida. The Good Luck Have Fun Game Bar was in the middle of hosting a Madden NFL 19 tournament. The game bar was connected to Chicago Pizza, a restaurant situated on the waterfront marketplace called Jacksonville Landing. 130 to 150 people were in attendance, either to participate or to simply observe the event. Competitive players from all over the country traveled to take part in the tournament. The players were competing for a spot in a later 16-player competition scheduled to be held in Las Vegas called the Madden Classic, as well as $5,000 according to ESPN.com. Katz had just made the 11-hour drive from Baltimore, Maryland to Jacksonville. With him were only a few items, sunglasses, a backpack, the clothes he was wearing, and unbeknownst to the other players and patrons, a small collection of handguns and ammunition. The event had officially begun on Saturday, August 25th, 2018. The day began at 11 a.m., and the entire event was live-streamed on Twitch. For those of you who happen to not know, Twitch is a site where you can stream or watch live streams of people playing various video games. Katz had competed on the first day, winning two matches and losing one. One of the competitors that Katz won against was Jordan Kanda. Jordan said that Katz seemed a little on edge that day and spoke little more than a few words to him following the match. His losing match was against a fellow player named Dennis Evil Ken Alston. After the game ended, Dennis attempted to give Katz a handshake, which he refused to reciprocate. Dennis later recalled that Katz only looked at him with a scowl. According to ESPN.com, a fellow competitor attempted to talk to Katz on the first day of the competition. He asked what upcoming Madden events Katz was looking forward to attending. His response was a cold, don't worry about it, before turning and walking away. When the next day of the competition rolled around, Katz was eager to compete once again. One game he played that day was against a player named Reginald Boogs Brown. Sometime during their match, Reginald paused the game and requested a tournament official to review a play made by Katz. Without going too much into detail here, Katz made a play that Reginald believed was barred from the competition. He learned that the rule had been overturned, so Katz was within his rights, and the match continued. Reginald acknowledged Katz's play, saying good stuff, to which Katz ignored. Even with the advantage Katz had, Reginald still ended up winning the game. No one knows the exact reason why Katz made the following decision, but nevertheless, he got up and left the venue. Reginald later said, quote, It wasn't much longer than 5 to 10 minutes before the first shots were fired. Right before 1.30 p.m., Katz re-entered the building and made his way back towards the game room, located in the rear corner of the restaurant. CCTV footage showed Katz as he deliberately walked past multiple employees and patrons in the restaurant, clearly targeting the game room portion of the building. Like stated before, there were potentially as many as 150 people in the building at the time, many of them crowded into the small game room. It was so packed that in order to get through the crowd, people had to shimmy sideways in the narrow gaps between clusters of people. Once he got back to the entrance of the game bar, Katz pulled his 45 caliber handgun, equipped with the laser sight, and aimed it, landing the red dot on 22-year-old Elijah Clayton's chest, who was sitting nearby to the entrance, facing it. No one noticed the bright dot as it darted across his body, then landed steady above his heart. Anyone watching Elijah's perspective of the tournament through Twitch could see it clear as day. Katz and Elijah, who also went by True Boy, had a history. They had previously played against each other, and on at least one occasion, they were said to have not been getting along. I will talk about this later on in the video, but I just want to make it clear that they knew each other prior to the shooting. At 1.34 p.m., Katz opened fire, shooting Elijah at least once in the chest and four times in the head. Three of the shots hit Elijah near the right eye, and one entered into his forehead. He had no chance to even try and get away, his body slumped in the gaming chair, and he died instantly. The entire thing was caught on livestream. The video portion of the stream cut out right before Elijah was shot, but viewers were still able to hear people screaming in terror as they were attempting to escape. Also heard were the sounds of multiple gunshots ringing out, shattering glass, and people running and stumbling over furniture. Multiple reports state that Katz was mumbling to himself as he shot randomly throughout the room. 
A cook named Brahim Johnson, who worked in the restaurant connected to the Good Luck Have Fun game bar, heard as the shots began. He immediately took cover in the kitchen, arming himself with knives. According to FloridaToday.com, Brahim even shouted to the gunman, warning, quote, if you come into this kitchen, you'll get stabbed. Dalton Kent was observing the tournament that day. He later said, quote, there were about two gunshots that I heard when it kind of registered. After the third one, everyone really knew what was going on. Dalton immediately ducked under a table and put his arms over his head, in an attempt to protect himself. He was struck by one of Katz's stray bullets. It had hit an object nearby, likely a table or chair, and was redirected into Dalton's ankle. He recalled, quote, When I was under the table is when I got shot. A bullet ricocheted and hit me in my ankle. Luckily, there was no permanent damage, so the bullet went through and through. At first, many thought the popping sounds were balloons, or maybe even a cap gun. Tony Montagnino was sitting with his back to cats, with his friend Timothy Anselmo standing over his shoulder. All at once, Tony heard the pops and felt a piercing pain radiating in his lower back. He had just been shot by cats. His friend Timothy was also shot, once in the chest, with another bullet entering his wrist and ripping through his hand. As he attempted to flee, he was struck again in the hip. Tony turned to face the shooter, recognizing his clothing, but unable to see his face past the gun held up in front of him. Tony yelled, Oh fuck! What did he shoot me with? Which can be heard on the live stream audio, before diving for cover to escape the shots. Tony thought about his options. Staying where he was was risky, as the gunman might come around to finish people off. But running would also pose a risk, as it would give the shooter a clear target. Tony decided on the ladder and made a run for the alternate exit door, which led to an outdoor patio. He saw multiple people crawling while being trampled by others, but it was the only clear way out. Tony's friend Timothy had already made his escape this way and took refuge in a neighboring building, so Tony attempted to do the same. When he reached the door, he noticed people maneuvering around an unknown object on the patio just beyond the exit. Tony looked down and saw his fellow competitor, 27-year-old Taylor Robertson, also known as Spot Me Please, laying on his back, eyes wide and looking towards the sky. Tony recalls thinking, not Taylor, not the most soft-spoken and humble guy in Madden, it couldn't be. Taylor was shot once in the back, the bullet exiting through his chest. Outside on the patio, things were just as chaotic as inside. People were running frantically in just about every direction while screaming at the top of their lungs. Tony actually believed that the shooter may have made his way outside, so he turned around and shuffled back into the smoke-filled game room. He pounded on the doors of the men's restroom, which promptly cracked open. The bathroom was completely full, and the people inside shut the door in his face. Tony later stated, quote, At that moment, I gave up. I gave up and laid down on the ground and I thought, I'm either going to die here, or someone's going to come help me. At this point, the shooting had stopped. The room was so quiet that Tony recalls hearing music coming from a pair of headphones discarded on the floor during the madness. Katz expended 12 bullets before the shooting stopped. It was at this time that Dalton, who was previously shot in the ankle, along with others, made a run for the exits of the building. Only two minutes after the shooting began, at 1.36 p.m., first responders arrived and rushed into the scene and began to clear the venue. Luck had it that a fire rescue ladder and engine training course was taking place right across the street at the time, which enabled them to arrive on the scene so fast. The training firefighters observed as people began to run out of the landing, screaming for help. Many victims made their way towards them, seeking aid for wounds they had sustained. There was no official area to treat the victims, but they made do with what they had. The firefighters quickly called for police and ambulances to come and did their best to treat the victims with the little supplies they had at the time. Many of the first responders took off towards the area that people were running from. They had no protective gear, but ran in anyway, determined to help the innocent victims. Little did anyone know, Katz had already taken his own life, shooting himself in the mouth with his handgun moments before. Despite not knowing if the gunman was still a threat, the ill-prepared fire rescue personnel ran in anyway. The first responders stormed the room yelling, where'd he go, over and over again. I'm unsure if they were able to identify Katz as the shooter then and there, 
but it's possible they mistook him as another victim. I read that the firefighters did not learn that the shooter was deceased until hours after the shooting, which makes me think they believed he was a victim at the time. Also, in the crime scene photos, Katz's gun was photographed a ways away from his body. It must have gotten launched through the air after he shot himself. He did also have his 9mm on him, but it was tucked into his waistband, under his shirt. Less than an hour later, at 2.13 p.m., a tweet was published from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office page. It read, quote, Mass shooting at the Jacksonville Landing. Stay far away from the area. The area is not safe at this time. Stay away. At 2.55 p.m., the account posted an update saying, We are finding many people hiding in locked areas at the landing. We ask you to stay calm, stay where you are hiding. SWAT is doing a methodical search inside the landing. We will get to you. Please don't come running out. Police were able to recover all of the wounded survivors remaining in the building, helping them to safety. Six people were rushed to the nearby University of Florida's Health Science Center, Jacksonville, for immediate treatment. Victims with less severe injuries were taken to hospitals a little further away. Later that evening, Jacksonville police confirmed and released the names of two victims that were killed during the shooting, 22-year-old Elijah Clayton, from Woodland Hills, California, and 27-year-old Taylor Robertson, from Ballard, West Virginia. Many of the players that attended the tournament said the same thing about David, that he kept to himself. One player, Shea Kivlin said, quote, he really kept to himself. In Madden competitions, he was different. He didn't really want to talk to anyone. He was just there to play. Shea knew Katz online, but had never met him in person prior to this event. Shea had narrowly escaped the shooting. Just 20 minutes before Katz began his rampage, Shea decided to head back to his hotel room to take a nap. Apparently, shortly before the shooting started, Katz had been heard asking an EA rep where Shea was, and when he would be back. When he arrived at his hotel room, Shea turned the Twitch broadcast of the event on and watched like many others, as the shots began. Following the shooting, another streamer, named Javon Lakey, also known as Yo Mama, went live to Twitch. On this broadcast, Javon had a lot to say about David Katz. He reinforced the idea that Katz had an extremely odd personality. Javon said that something always seemed off about Katz. According to Javon, two years prior, Katz participated in another Madden competition, along with Elijah Clayton, Anthony Pulley, who goes by Misery, and another player. Javon recalls that Katz played a match against both Elijah and Anthony. Elijah and Katz reportedly got into it a little during their match, with the normal trash talking expected. But according to Javon, Anthony and Katz really got into it that night. Javon claims that Anthony was being extremely hostile towards Katz during their entire match. He said that Katz was reciprocating the energy, but it was not nearly as harsh as Anthony's. After the competition was over, Anthony and Elijah called an Uber to take them back to the hotel where all the competitors were staying. As Katz attempted to get inside the car, they shut the car door in his face and had the driver take off, leaving him behind. Katz then reportedly went back inside and angrily told Jovan, quote, I hate misery. The next day, Katz had another opportunity to beat Anthony in a match. He would need to win this to move on to the next portion of the competition, so tensions were high during this game. Unfortunately for Katz, he ended up losing the match and therefore was disqualified from the event. In his live stream the day after the shooting, Jovan said that he believed the shooting was a result of many negative interactions between Katz and other Madden players. He is not convinced that Katz did what he did solely because he lost the match on August 26, 2018. Another thing I read on a few, but not all sources, is that Elijah had apparently distributed a book that Katz wrote without his permission. According to the sources, Elijah purchased a book created and published by Katz, then posted it online for everyone to read without having to buy it. Katz from that point on made it clear that he did not like Elijah. Also, during my research, I read a few times that Elijah would continually pick on Katz in particular. This may explain why Katz targeted Elijah first, but like mentioned before, Katz most likely snapped due to a multitude of incidents involving other players. Anthony Pulley posted a statement following the shooting. In the post, he talks about winning against Katz two years prior and also the incident that happened outside, where they left Katz on the side of the road. 
A part of his statement reads, quote, Madden dudes would always call him weird or whatever it may be, and always said some shit about him, possibly doing some wild shit like this, and everything came full circle today, and he actually did the wild shit people have talked about before. I wholeheartedly believe had I gone out this weekend like I was thinking about, he would have shot me as well for the shit I described that took place two years ago. So as happy as I am that I didn't go, the pain and sadness trumps that feeling, cause we lost two homies in Eli and Taylor. I love you guys, and neither of you ever deserved this. Tony Montagnino later recalled the horrors of that day, and the struggles he still faces. He said, quote, Physically, getting shot sucks and it hurts, but the mental aspect of it is 100 times worse. Was I a coward for looking out for myself? I still hear the screams, the noises. I smell the smoke from the gun. Everything about it runs through my head as soon as I lay down. Two uninjured patrons later came out and stated that Katz was not mumbling nonsense during the shooting as many thought. They claimed that after each shot, he was counting to himself. Many believed that he wanted to make sure to have at least one more bullet for himself. The motive for this attack is still not completely known. I'd like to know what your thoughts are. Do you think his prior mental health issues had a play in the attack? Do you think that he had a vendetta out for his fellow competitors stemming from previous interactions? Or do you think that he opened fire purely because he was angry that he lost his spot in the tournament? It's hard for me to imagine someone going to such extreme lengths over losing a video game. Please let me know what you think. Elijah Clayton was born on June 19, 1996. He had six brothers and three sisters. Elijah was described by his family as a good man, one who did not believe in violence. In his real life, Elijah loved football, so it's no surprise that he gravitated towards Madden as his video game of choice. Through the tournaments he participated in, Elijah made a good living. According to his profile on easports.com, he won over $50,000 during his gaming career. He was saving his winnings to pay for college to further his education, according to his family. During a press conference, Elijah's cousin said, quote, Our family has been forever changed. Nothing will replace the love that we have for Elijah. There is a hole that will never be filled. Just from his family's statements, you can tell that Elijah meant so much to them. He will be remembered as the fun and hardworking person he was. Shea Kivlin wrote a heartbreaking message following Elijah's death. Quote, Rest in peace true. Elijah Clayton, one of my best friends in life. I talk to you almost every day for the last five years. You were one of the most kind and genuine people I've ever met. I love you like a brother. I'm gonna miss hearing you laugh every day and seeing your genuine smile. Taylor Mack Robertson was born on November 26, 1990. He graduated from James Monroe High School in 2009, where he was a member of the Honor Society. Like Elijah, Taylor loved to play football, and he was an exceptional athlete in high school. According to a video posted by EA Sports, Taylor said he had been playing Madden NFL ever since he was 10 years old. He had only begun playing competitively a few years prior to the shooting. Over the course of his professional gaming career, he had won over $80,000, according to his easports.com profile. Anyway, after he graduated high school, Taylor earned a bachelor's degree in accounting and later worked as a credit analyst for First Community Bank. Taylor met and married his wife, Holly, and together they had a son named Reed. Derek Jones, who had previously lost to Taylor, said he was, quote, one of the nicest people I ever met. He went on to say, quote, there's no way that guy did anything to deserve to get shot. He's got a family at home, and he just came out here to try to win some money for this family. So many people were affected by this violent act. The victims and their families, of course, but also the entire Madden Esports community. Often described as a brotherhood, most players are really close to one another. It's an understatement to say the community was hit hard by this tragedy. On the day, and in the days following the deaths of Elijah and Taylor, Many posts were made by their heartbroken friends as a tribute to both victims. One wrote, crying and in so much pain, prayers to the families of True Boy and Spot Me, all over a video game. Two of our brothers are gone, man, and it's so disturbing. One of the most tragic days I've experienced. This community is like family, broken. Another reads, 
all over a video game. We lost two angels today. Spot me or Taylor Robertson was a father and a husband. True Boy or Eli Clayton was someone's son, and he was still young. This makes me so sick. Rest in paradise. A series of lawsuits against EA, the mall, and the restaurant where the shooting occurred were filed by numerous people. Eventually, the Jacksonville Landing was closed down and is no longer open to the public. Overall, two innocent people had their lives violently taken away from them that day. They were there to do what they loved, competing in a tournament to hopefully win some money. They did not deserve what happened to them that day. It was a completely senseless attack, which destroyed the lives of so many. Please take a moment to remember these two bright young men. They had so much potential to go on and do what they loved. Also think of the people hurt by the shooting, the family members of the victims, and also their friends and fellow players. Eleven other people were injured during the shooting, some from bullet wounds, others from being trampled in their attempted escape. I can imagine most, if not all, of the people that were there that day have extreme mental scars that may never heal, so please keep them in your thoughts as well. Thank you guys for sticking through to the end of this video. I hope you learned something new about this absolutely horrific case. I appreciate all of the support, and I will continue to cover these cases, in hopes that the victims are never forgotten. I'll be back with another video soon, but until then, I hope you all have a great day.